Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode, and I'm excited to have with me Tanuj Tapliol, who is the CEO and co-founder at Spot AI. So welcome, Tanuj. How are you doing? Um, thank you for having me. It's great to be here today. Oh, I'm excited. I'm very excited to have you. I mean, you're doing some wonderful things at Spot AI. And I, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about you, you know, go check out that previous episode listeners and see all he was talking about, about, you know, video and technology. So I'm curious, tell me about how do you, how did you get there from to be the CEO of Spot AI? You must have had an interesting journey. Yeah. Yeah. So when, let's see, uh, where would you like me to start? Um, I well, could maybe, start with school. Where, yeah. Where'd you grow up at? Yeah. Where, you know, let's start yeah, again. Where'd yeah. you grow up, go to school, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up in the 90s in the San Francisco Bay Area. I grew up in in Mountain View, which is now uh, where the headquarters of Google is. Um, and from an early age, you know, my I was very, very exposed to new technology and startup companies and and startup technology. And it was really through you know my friends and my friends' parents, honestly. It's it's because like you know we were the kids of all these like you know business people and engineers at all of these different technology startups around us that just from an early age through osmosis you learn about what new technology can do for lots of different industries and markets. Um, so when you grow up in an environment like that, it 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 kind of gets you really interested and excited about about new technology and about what new technologies can do. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, from a very, very early age, um, I was exposed to that and it, it made me convinced that I wanted to see if I could contribute there uh, with whatever new technology would look like when, when I was an adult, and when I was entering the workplace. That's really cool. So you, you got it from, from, go, from day one, you've been sur submerged yeah. in this. Now, where'd you go to yeah. school? Um, so I went to UCLA for undergrad. Um, so I went down to Los Angeles, uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Um, I studied electrical engineering. And the reason I wanted to go there was because I, I kind of felt like I would get a really well-rounded experience. Uh, before that, I went to like a very small kind of private school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're like, you know, 100 people in your graduating class, right? It, it was a very, very different environment. Um, like we didn't, we didn't really have a football team. Like, I don't think our football team actually scored my senior year. Um, right. And you had the same people playing offense and defense. So everyone was just exhausted all yeah, the time. Yeah. So I wanted to go to a place where I could, you know, like be in a school with, you know, like a school spirit and, you know, a mascot and, you know, good sports and then, you know, a good education as well. Um, so that's kind of why I picked UCLA and I studied electrical engineering there. And then I did research in a, interestingly, a bioinstrumentation lab where we were building equipment to help discover new kinds of drugs for heart related ailments. Um, Very so, cool. Okay. So I worked on these like machines actually. Um, that would move fluids around and then be able to test different types of compounds and then, you know, provide measurements and results, basically. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. How about from there? Yeah. When, when I did that, I mean, that was kind of one of my first tastes of what would happen if you made technology easy for people to use. So what we did in this lab was we, we, we would simulate, believe it or not, the cells in our bodies. And we would make it very easy to produce artificial ones and then automate injection of a drug into that cell to test what the effects would be. And it used to be that you needed a PhD to do that. And even me just speaking it, like I, I still don't know how to do it. Um, but um, what we came up with in the lab was a machine that would automate all the steps to be able to test a drug just hitting a button so you could have any operator able to test different types of drug compounds on uh, heart proteins in very, very high throughput. And that was kind of my first taste that, wow, like if you take technology and make it very, very simple for someone to use, you can really, really 
supercharge them and change, you know, how they approach their jobs. So from there, you know, I was pretty set, interestingly, on wanting to do a career, um, you know, in the, the medical device area, actually, um, and in, in the healthcare area. And then I actually had a um, opportunity come uh, through a childhood friend. He referred me to a company called Meraki. And Meraki was in a completely different area. Um, they were building easy to use IT equipment uh, for businesses. So Wi Fi routers, uh, networking appliances and switches, firewalls. They made it really, really easy to manage those devices. And the reason I joined there, you know, after UCLA was because in the med tech world, it might have taken me five to six years to see a single thing come to market and actually impact, you know, an end user. It took years and years and years. But at Meraki, it only took six months from when we first got an idea to when we brought it into market. And that really excited me because I felt that it would accelerate my learning and I could learn, you know, as fast as they would give me give me work. Um, you know, I, I wanted to see if I was up for the challenge of being able to learn more. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's great. Now, now tell me. What's what other what are the next steps? Because something led you to spot AI, and I'm really curious what what you yeah. know, those steps sort of got you got you there. Yeah. So you know after after Meraki, so Meraki got acquired by Cisco um, okay. a couple years into my tenure there, and I actually wanted to go back to school. So you know education is something that's extremely important to me, and. I wanted to go back to school and, and, you know, get more education and get, get a master's. Um, so, you know, I, I applied to grad school and got really, really lucky uh, to get into grad school. So I went uh, back actually to school after having worked for a few years. Okay. Um, and now, where while did you go I was to school at, at? Um, my graduate program was at Stanford. So okay. I was in the um, engineering masters uh, where I was studying signal processing and artificial intelligence. And then I was also getting an MBA at the same time. And so all of a sudden I don't feel qualified to have this uh, interview. But, uh, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. <laughs> oh no, no, no. I kicked my butt. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Well, it, it, it probably really, should really if, it's, if it's at Stanford and <laughs> yeah. it sounded like you were doing a double masters. Yeah. It, it should kick your butt, man. It was, it was really hard. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're all rusty. Like you don't remember, you know, what linear algebra is and like, yeah, you're so rusty, right? Like you haven't done homework in like years and years. Yeah. And then you're going back into this super academic environment and yeah, it was, it was rough. Like it was not easy, but I learned a lot. And, <laughs> and it was in that program that, you know, the idea for spot kind of germinated okay. and, and came around. Um, and the basic idea was this. There are traditional industries, right? You know, the factories that power our economy, you know, logistics companies, supply chain companies, all the way into oil and gas construction, right? That are criminally underserved with technology, in my opinion. And, you know, me and my co-founders, we saw this opportunity that video was being massively underused by all of these critical industries. And if you can make it easy for people at work to access video off cameras and make decisions off of it, it would fundamentally change how they operate and how they approach their jobs. So that was observation number one, that we felt that there is this need in the market that wasn't being met by the security camera guys. Second, um, on the technology side, there was a major technology inflection point that there were new kinds of chips being invented. Um, these are AI chips that could look at a video or look at an image and tell you what's in the image. And these chips had just been invented and they had just come about. And they were like 10 bucks, like dirt cheap chips, right? Yeah. And we kind of put two and two together and said, if you could build software for these chips, right, and make it really, really easy then for an end user, you know, on a construction site or in a, you know, industrial setting in a factory, right? Um, harness that power, right? 
and find what they were looking for, then you could have a real impact on the world. And that kind of formed the genesis of Spot AI that, you know, we felt that their video was a massively underutilized data source in, in the enterprise. And there was finally a technology that would let you index video cheaply and search for video cheaply. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Now, did you did you always envision yourself being an entrepreneur? Yeah. Yeah. I think oh, yeah? I've had that idea for a long time. And it it comes back to my childhood that I was just extremely lucky to be around a bunch of people that, you know, like had seen entrepreneurship and, you know, viewed it as a way to make a dent in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Because it can be, you know, it can be a scary, you know, oh, yeah. uh, journey yeah. when if you've never done it, I've never been ex around it. So, you know, what, yeah. I guess that it gave you a lot of confidence to, to move forward because you've, because you could see the impact that you thought it, that you're going to make with Spot AI. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it is it is pretty scary at times, right? And the reason for that is because you're creating something out of nothing and you're trying to put structure into a place that has absolutely no structure, right? right. And what I mean by this is that, you know, like it's, you know, anytime you hear, you know, good news or bad news, if you're in a big company, you're like a big ship and that little wave is going to hit the ship, but you're pretty buffered from it. You don't even feel it, you know, sipping the, the pina colada up on the, the, the deck, right? That's right. That's right. But a startup, when you start the startup, I mean, you're in a little towboat, right? That's right. You're you feeling feel every that wave. wave. That's right. Exactly. All of them. Exactly. All it's level. the same size wave is the point I'm making, right? Like the wave hasn't yep. gotten any bigger, but your boat's a lot smaller. And then as you're growing the company, you're building that boat, like with all the your team that you're attracting around you, right? And you're building it bigger and bigger underneath you, right? So you can't let the highs get too high or the lows get too low because you're going to hit both, right? And you have to have that long-term view and that belief that you can help somebody at the end of the day and you yeah. can really help a customer out. And you can make it easier for a customer to solve their problem, right? right? And in our case, we make it easier for people to access video off cameras and make, you know, safety operations and security decisions off of it, right? If you make that easy, right, like that becomes a North Star is like I'm helping all these people at work, you know, like solve problems. And yeah. that getting it gets you through those highs and lows. Yeah. And I guess having the right mentality too, right? It's not a get rich quick type of, of, of venture. No. You know, you, you need to have the right motives. Yeah, it'll never work if, if that's a mindset. I mean, you, you have to have a customer centric mindset that you want to help somebody. Right. And then and then you don't know how long it'll take. Right. So when you're solving a problem, you know, building the business, you don't know, is it going to be a week? Is it going to be a month? Is it going to be a year, five years? Like you you're trying to do it as fast as you can. Yeah. But you can't have this idea that, you know, it it's a get rich quick type of thing. Like you have to be thinking long-term. So, so let's say it's not going as, as, as good or as fast as you want. So you give some advice out there. Maybe there's a young engineer who, who wants to start a business. Yeah. You know, the, is it surround yourself with the right people? Is it follow the, is it mentorship? Is it, you know, you know, mastermind groups, like what, like what type of stuff would you? So a couple of things. One, it's wise to find people who are one stage ahead of you in their journeys, solving whatever problems they want to solve. So get someone a half step ahead of you or one step ahead of you. Um, and that could be, for example, if you're still in the prototype phase, find somebody who has three customers, right? Like just, just getting started, right? And then if you're in the prototype phase, find somebody a stage or half a stage behind you who's in the idea phase, right? And then start checking in with them and sharing problems you're trying to solve with them. And you're going to be able to cross pollinate and learn a lot. I think that's one really tangible and concrete thing you can do. The second is you're trying to it, think of it more like croquet than golf, right? You're trying to do a lot of little adjustments to find your way to the customer pain, right? To that desperate customer. So rather than taking a big swing with your driver, you know, 250 yards, take, you know, 25 tiny little 10-yard hits along the way 
And what this basically means is, you know, as you're you're trying to build the business and you hit, you know, areas that are really working well or you hit a roadblock, right? Make a lot of little micro adjustments and micro pivots along the way. And don't be afraid to make those changes really quickly. Um, and that can be another way to kind of work through to that, you know, to the goal you have of, you know, impacting a lot of customers. Yeah. No doubt. I mean, I, I love that. So the croquet versus golf, that's a, that's a, <laughs> a wonderful analogy. That's the first time I've heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it, it, it just, it helps you realize that you have a lot in your control and it, it compounds and builds over time, something, something impactful for, for a customer, right? It's not going to happen overnight. Right. So just right. be, you know, it's, it's good to be a little patient, but then, quick to decision right and you can do that if you're only thinking you know i'm just gonna increment in this one area and i'm gonna solve that problem today for example now how about how about the importance of mentors or mastermind groups you know when you're, when you're yeah when you're starting a bit when you're rolling business do they do they play a factor yeah absolutely um perspective is is an amazing thing and it's an amazing gift and you know mastermind groups mentors they can definitely get you that and the cool thing about it is that, you know, they'll have seen this rodeo before a couple times. Yeah, yeah. And and you need to surround yourself with a mix of them. And then there are going to be certain times in the journey where you're really leaning on them for help and for advice. There are going to be other parts of the journey where, you know, like you're not, you know, like you're not talking with them as much and that's OK. So it kind of ebbs and flows. Um, and you want to surround yourself with enough diverse opinions. Right. So that you can basically get um, the coverage you need. Right. To, to be able to get that advice. And then it's something that you hope to be able to pay for, you know, once you're in their shoes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And I, I'm curious. So let's let's shift back to video technology to where you're at. Is there a common myth? You know, when people think about videos and their plants in an industrial setting, yeah. you know, they they, yeah. they they have, you know, right out the gate, you maybe think of the guardhouse that you yeah. that you sign yeah. into, and that's the only video you see, right? It may be in the guardhouse. Yeah. So is there a common myth that for industrials around Absolutely. video technology that you knock that you like I, to knock out? I mean, I think you 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 hit it right on the head. I mean, video intelligence, it's this idea that video is useful for so much more than just security. Yeah. And yeah. we're seeing tons of our customers, like an absolute torrent of end users. Like I'm talking thousands of end users who've changed their relationship with their cameras and they're not using their cameras for just security anymore. Right. And that to me is the, the, the biggest myth that I see that, and it's not something that I'm you know willing. It's something that our customers are already doing and opening our eyes to. Right. Which is that it's not just about using cameras in the guard tower. Like, yes, that guard still has a problem to solve using cameras. But right. the usefulness of video just goes far, far, far beyond just security. Right. And we talked about this in the last episode, but every single persona in the workplace. Right. Um, can benefit using video intelligence and using AI on video so they can find out what's happening and why it's happening. Right. We talked about right. the stack of boxes being too high, right? You can get an alert for that, right? Or someone's not wearing their safety goggles, right? We talked about stopped conveyor belts, trucks waiting in the loading bay, right? Um, there, there's so many use cases for video once you actually look. And if you make it easy for these people at work to access the video, they start using their cameras in very exciting new ways. So that's the biggest myth. It's cameras are not just for security and surveillance. No doubt. No doubt. Now what's, yeah. what's the coolest video story that you have from an industrial Ooh, standpoint? Yeah. There's, there's gotta be a good one that you just like tell at the dinner parties, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, there's one, I can't name the customer. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll change the name a, to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're a very large internet satellite um, company. Okay. And the idea is that they have all these satellites deployed in space and these satellites enable internet access to all these remote regions. Right. And they have base stations 
that are basically these big antennas that exist in base stations across the country. And think of these, I mean, these are on the tops of mountains in North Dakota, right? Like they're literally going and having Eskimos, you know, go and install these systems, right? Right. And, right. And, and extreme weather conditions. And we help this company monitor their antennas for frosting, believe it or not. Okay. So for actual um, physical damage. And the reason this is important to them is because when an antenna starts frosting, it's an indicator that there could be a failure of that ground hop base station, right? Right. Um, because it's it, the, 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 the frosting will impact the radiation and reflections of that antenna. Okay. So we could have never predicted that a customer would buy us and use us for that really, really specific use case. But they're not using it for security at all. So what, when it starts frosting, what do they do? Um, so it helps them decide, well, one, they can alert and they can let kind of people on the comm side. So these are thermal engineers who are actually looking okay. at these. They can provide a notification and an alert to the comms people that there's a, there's a physical problem with that particular base station. Right. And then, and being able to do that allows them to drive process in other parts of the organization to deal with it. And two, it helps them figure out how can they engineer a better antenna, right? Right. Okay. Like what what can they be doing differently, right? So that that antenna is less susceptible to water accumulation and ice accumulation. Because That's... how you basically build the antenna, right? You might have stamping, you might have different cutouts in the antenna. It forms some sort of radiation pattern, right? But then if you don't design it right, it might also create ice accumulation in different sections of the antenna. So it also okay. helps them with the design of the antennas, interestingly. Okay. So I, I was envisioning, you know, Mr. Maintenance Tech out there with the dryer, you know, trying to go get the frosting, out, you know, to defrost yeah, the antenna. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, but they can't easily send people up there. That's the interesting okay. thing. So now, that's a that's like an industrial use case, which like you could never predict, right? No. Like no. So it's it it's one of my favorites. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And I am curious. Last, last question about work. When are yeah. you the happiest at work? What, what are you doing when you're, when you have Ooh. the most joy in your day? Great question. That, I love that question. So I've been doing a thing lately, which is where I journal and I keep track of my schedule and I say, you know, what gives me energy and then what drains my energy. Right. Right. And then it's, it's called like an energy audit. So basically I'm doing that for myself every week. And it's, it's really, really enlightening because what you learn is the stuff that you enjoy and gives you joy. Like that's when you're in a real state of flow and like when you're vibing and having a lot of fun and, and then you, you deal with difficult problems too. So, you know, it's for me, you know, the, the parts of my job that give me a lot of joy. Um, I think I like talking to customers. And I like talking to candidates when we're hiring. Okay. And the reason I enjoy it is in both cases, I get to learn about somebody else and I get to learn about someone else's goals and mission and ambitions and problems they're trying to solve and being able yeah. to build a bit of empathy there and see if there's a way I can help them. Like that, that, that gets me really excited and it puts a smile on my face because even if there isn't a match, the opportunity to learn about somebody like it's 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 kind of cool like i yeah. you know like I, I i like that so yeah with customers cool. it's yeah yeah with customers it's you know can i you know help them solve their problem and what set of problems do they have that they're trying to solve and yeah. then if we're the right match for them then it's really cool because we can help them use video intelligence and use our cameras to solve many more problems in the workplace, right? And in some cases, they might not be trying to access video at all, and that's okay too, right? Yeah. In that case, you know, like you, you tell them to have a nice day, and you know, you move on with your day, that's right? That's right. That's right. And then, and then with the talent side, it's very similar. That there are a lot of ambitious people working really hard and in good faith to develop themselves personally and professionally. And right. if I can provide an opportunity for them to get for them to accelerate their ability to get to their mission and their end state, right? 
I would love to earn that trust, right? And that opportunity for them to be able to develop themselves, right? So that we, they can come here and we can provide them the coaching, the mentorship, the development, the challenges, the problems they have to solve, right? And then a great group of people around them. That also gets me really excited. And the same outcome happens there too, which you might talk to somebody and, you know, like they might want their career to go one way. And then, you know, we're looking for something a different way. So it's really good to be able to surface that up front and, you know, no harm, no foul. And maybe, you know, refer a few companies to them if, you know, they're looking for something else. Um, I love it. Yeah. I love I love the fact that you're doing that audit. That, that, that's a good self-practice. Now, let's let's take a shift and let's get outside of spot AI and all the, the wonderful sure. things you're doing. Yeah. What do you outside of being a, a professional croquet player? What what do you like doing for fun? <laughs> yeah, so I don't. I actually play golf personally. Okay, I'm really, so you're really a golfer, bad, <laughs> but I'm awful. So it turns okay. into croquet. So so I'm an amateur croquet player. Um, I got you because I yeah. I mean, I I end up just using my irons way more than I should, and it's uh, you know, it's uh, I I don't color inside eventually. the lines. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I do. I'll never pick up the ball, but I'll take my time. There you um, go. Yeah. Anything else for fun? Yeah. Yeah. I, I follow a lot of sports. Um, so I love the NBA. I follow a lot of tennis. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. NBA and tennis. I used to watch NFL, not anymore. And it just kind of organically just dropped off. Like I don't even have like a good reason why I stopped because as a kid and in college like I watch all the time red zone every Sunday yeah um and yeah I mean it just kind of stopped it's got burnout on it probably yeah and I again I don't know why it happened so a lot of sports um I love reading and what I love reading are biographies so I have a oh. lot of fun reading biographies what name name a couple what are what are your favorite biographies I'm just curious oh man yeah a Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, fantastic book. It's about the story of Nike. Yeah. And people don't realize this, but Phil Knight, he was an accountant. And he sold shoes out of the back of his car for eight years or something, like almost a decade um, in the 60s. And while he worked as an accountant and he was like running Nike out of his parents' basement. And the way he built he went from there into building such a massive iconic company. It's really, really interesting to me. Very cool. So that's one. Um, then um, I really liked James Blake's biography. James Blake is a, um, he's a professional tennis player. I think he reached number four in the world, like, you know, maybe 15 years ago. Um, he had a pretty fantastic biography um, because the grit and resilience it takes to become the best at a sport. Like, it's really fun. Like, I was never at that level. And it's just fun for me to learn and see how did those people approach their craft and hone their craft? Because you can have talent, but you, you wake up one day, it's not just going to happen. Like, you have to right. make enormous sacrifices. And right. that was also, that's another really good one. Um, let's see, I'll give you one more. Okay. Actually, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to pull up audible right now and i'll give you um i do a lot of audiobooks too but it just keeps okay. me busy i'm going on a walk commute right might as well yeah. you know play something um the third one that i would really recommend is um let's see oh this is a good one it's called the bitcoin standard okay I know nothing about Bitcoin. I don't understand it. Like it's this weird foreign concept to me. Um, and I don't know if I, like, I'm curious, like what, what's your perspective of cryptocurrency? Well, my perspective is you don't invest in things you do not understand. So, you know, I, I do financial <laughs> coaching as well. So people have yeah. asked me this and, and this is something that, you know, if yeah. you get it, if you understand it, if you feel comfortable about it, then I would say lean into it. But if you don't, yeah, I would ask a lot of questions. I would read books like you're like you're doing yeah. and then formulate your own opinion based on facts. Yeah, I don't understand it at all. So I said, I'm, I'm going to read a book and see if I can somewhat understand it. There you go. So so the Bitcoin standard is a very interesting book because. 
most of the book doesn't talk about Bitcoin at all. And that's my favorite part about it. It talks about the concept of money and currency. Because my problem with the Bitcoin stuff is it gets so evangelical so early on that I can't filter it and like make sense of it. Uh, But then this book, it's just about how did the idea of currency even get invented by humans? And like, how did that concept evolve over the years? Like, like, for example, in prisons, they use cigarettes as currency, right? Like, why a cigarette, right? And, you know, in early civilizations, they might have used grains and then eventually gold and precious metals and then fiat. And like, it's, it's a really interesting book because then it helps you build the logical case for why Bitcoin could be a big deal. Right. Um, so, Very cool. And we'll, we'll yeah. make sure we put those uh, those links in the show notes too because I'm sure, sure there's some listeners out there now, Tanuj, that you've got their curiosity up. They want to go learn about this Bitcoin. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, I'm still a noob, but uh, <laughs> but um, I'm maybe 1%. <laughs> I learned 1% I about it. Yeah. Now, now, one thing we love to do, Tanuj, on these conversations with our heroes, we like to play a lightning round. And we love, and okay. I'm just going to yeah. fire a bunch of random stuff at you. And I, uh, okay. this, this lets our listeners get to know a little bit about you, you know, personally. Okay. So you're cool. We'll, we'll jump right in. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's your favorite food? Oh, I'm already failing at this. I have too many. <laughs> uh, sausage McMuffin. A sausage McMuffin. That is the first for Eco SY favorite <laughs> food. Okay. That, that tells me a little bit about you, my friend. Okay. All right. So how about your favorite adult beverage? Uh, wheat beer. A wheat beer. Any any particular brand? Um, no, I'm pretty open. I like Allagash. They're Portland, Maine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What's yeah. on uh what's on your nightstand? It was a lamp, um, <laughs> but we <laughs> now but it's we a, made you take it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a cup of water, and that white book is actually literally Bitcoin standard. The book I just okay, talked that, about. That is a bit yeah. okay. That is, yeah, yeah. What's yeah. your all uh, right? What's your favorite app on your phone? Uh, Audible. Audible. Okay, this is I've, I've talked to several pe- people lately that are really big on Audible. All right, yeah. so curious. Favorite sports team. Now let's go. Let's go NBA first. You said NBA. What's your What's your NBA team? Um, Warriors. Warriors. Grew up here. In, yeah. T- yeah. Tennis player. Um, I like Nadal. You like Nadal? Okay. Now, when you were watching football, was that Was that Forty Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. growing up here, those were the teams, and I like the Raiders okay. too. Yeah. And the Raiders too. Okay. Yeah. Baseball. Yeah. Uh, Giants. Giants. Okay. Got it. Got it. What's your all time yeah. favorite movie? Ooh. Um, Ocean's Eleven. Ooh, great movie. Great movie. Yeah. How about TV show? Uh The Wire. The Wire. Nice. Is do you have any guilty pleasures? Um, well, apart from the sausage McMuffins, which I wish I didn't speak out loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um I think I can like I use TikTok maybe a little bit too much. Okay. Okay. So and you, I, you, I look at, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. So you, you're, you're all, I, yeah. it's, it's a time suck, right? It really can suck oh, you down yeah. if you're not careful. It's awful. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's awful. Like I'll sit on my couch and then it's like, boom, like 20 minutes have passed. Yeah. yeah. I haven't spent more than seven seconds consuming a single piece of content. <laughs> um, right. So now, yeah, what's your uh, what's the coolest place you've ever been? Ooh, Iceland, literally Ooh. and figuratively. Yeah. yeah, what's the what's the one place you got to go one day that you haven't been yet? Oh, um, hmm. this isn't very lightning, is it? Um, there's so many places. I I mean, this is a very like nostalgic one for me, right? Like. I love traveling. I'm sure you you might like to travel from time to time. Right. And it's kind of sucked. It's been two full years where yeah. I haven't been able to do that, right? Yeah. And it's kind of fills my soul and like it's I I mean, yes you can travel and I have been, you know, flying, you know, like you know, whenever I can, right? But internationally, right? Or going on right. vacation somewhere, right? 
So, I mean, I've been here once, but I would love to go to South Korea again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's just Very a cool, cool country. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Now, last question in the lightning round, Tanuj, uh, dogs or cats? Oh, dogs. hundred percent. I just got uh -huh. a dog. So what kind of dogs you it. get? Um, he's a rescue mix. So he's okay. a, he's a Husky Rottweiler German Shepherd mix. Oh, nice. So, nice. Yeah. He's what's his name? His name is Mellow. M E L L O W. Mellow. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, he, Very cool. He, he is not mellow, but uh, he's still a puppy. <laughs> But it's very good. It's like a hundred hundred pound puppy. So he right, yeah. He makes his his presence known. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is great, Tanu. This has been wonderful to get to know you. You know, we we call it Eco yeah. Ask Why. We always wrap up with the why. So this is this talks about your passion. So if somebody wants to know Tanu, what is your personal why? What would it be? Yeah, I want to be in service to people and help people, and I believe technology is a awesome way to be able to do that and that's what's fueled me ever since i've been you know a little kid maybe you know i'm i'm eager to please and you know i i want to i want to be able to help people and i think you know whether it's my own people in my company or our customers like if i can provide opportunity for education right for training right to be able to help people solve more problems with technology i think technology can be a big force multiplier for that that's kind of what fuels me is can I, can I help more people? Um, I love it. I yeah. love it. Well, this has been a great conversation for the listeners that want to connect with Tanuj and spot AI, go to the show notes. We'll have all the links there. You can connect directly with him there. This has been, it's been a blessing. Thank you so much Tanuj. I hope Thank you have you. a wonderful day. Wish you nothing but Thank the you. best for you and spot AI. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that was a fun conversation with Tanuj. What a great guy. I mean, he's done so many phenomenal things. The CEO at Spot AI, but his heart is all about serving others. I mean, it really is. That's what when he when he gets excited is when he's helping people. I love the croquet, not golf analogy. So I think that's a nugget that I remember in the energy audit. What a great thing that we can all do and start apply, applying that in our lives to see what gives us energy and what takes away. And you know what? Let's lean more into stuff that gives us the energy. So great conversation. Check out the show notes. There's lots of ways to hook up with Tanuj, connect with him directly, follow all the cool stuff they're doing at Spot AI. Now the war stories are coming in and we need more because we're, we're finding that brings a ton of value to people. We want the good, the bad, the, the stuff that just gets you excited because we're trying to get people excited about manufacturing and industry. So go to the show notes, check out the links there. You can connect directly with us on all the social media accounts. And that's the best way to send us a message. Now, if you're enjoying the Eco Ask Why, share it with someone. Take it out your pocket right now. Send a text message. You know, I'm going to keep asking you because I know how easy it is to share this out. Send this episode to someone who needs to hear it because there may be some encouragement here that's going to pick up their day. Give us a five-star rating. Write a one-sentence review. All that makes a big impact. Everyone, I hope you all have, have a great day. And to remember, keep asking why.